pause for critical reflection brought to you by the New England Literacy Resource Center and presented by Moraine Valley Community College. My name is Ebony Vandross and I'm the e-learning and communications associate for World Education's U.S. Division and I'm so glad you could all join us today. And I just have a couple of notes before we begin. For those not familiar with Zoom, uh, this slide will show you some basic uh, controls and I'm sure you're all familiar with them by now, but if you have some sort of tech issue or you have a question, please use the hand raise feature and that will get my attention if I don't see your comment in the chat. And if you have any other issues, please email me at the email address in the fourth box and I'll uh, drop that in the chat as well. And please be aware that we will be recording this webinar, so we'll follow up with an email with a copy of the recording and the slides for you to share with your colleagues in your states. Uh, our next webinar, um, two weeks from now, is uh, equity program development, I'm sorry, equity program improvement and collaboration, what data can do for you, and it'll be held on Thursday, January 27th at 2 p.m., presented by the staff at WestEd. Um, you can register at the link shown on the slide or scan the QR code on the right side of the screen. And we will share this info again at the end of the presentation in case you miss it. And lastly, without further ado, I would like to introduce the team from Moraine Valley Community College and thank you all for joining us. Recording in progress. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can change the focus to a soft blur or sharpen it to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all that you see and hear. You are about to participate in a great adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to... Welcome to the 7070 quiz, the pause for critical reflection presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmela Ochoa. I am the ABE ASC coordinator at Moraine Valley Community College. Our main campus is located in Palos Hills, Illinois, about 20 miles southwest of beautiful downtown Chicago. My amazing co-workers will now take a moment to introduce themselves. Hello, everybody. My name is Christian Torres. I'm the transition specialist at Moraine Valley for our adult education program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Zajac. I'm the Assistant Dean of Student Success. And I'm Patrick Lowen. I'm also an Education Specialist that works with our adult and transitioning student population. Okay, so today we are going to present to you a new type of classroom assessment technique. And hopefully throughout this presentation, we'll be able to challenge some of your previous thinking about the ways in which um, CATS or classroom assessment techniques have been traditionally utilized in the classroom. Um, also, what type of feedback that they can produce and how will that feedback potentially help or impact an instructor's teaching? So uh, the 7070 quiz is really a formative CAT and is designed not to focus on the preparedness of students, but really rather the intuitive capabilities of the instructor. So it's a little different. The notion though is really kind of simple. So at the beginning of a term and after a little bit of a short review period, the question becomes, can the instructor write a test that he or she is confident that 70% of his or her students can then pass at a 70% proficiency level. And that's governed strictly by the instructor's intuitive sense 
of the first few weeks of instruction. Um, we, we've done this and the results were quite surprising. Uh, later, we will be able to share with you some of our experiences that our instructors had while creating their own 770 quiz and what they were able to learn from that process. Okay, so uh, teaching and learning. So the 7070 quiz was developed because instructors really, we felt need more than just uh, teaching tips and techniques, right? Uh, we do lots of professional development in this area and instructors should understand their really under, their, their underlying beliefs, we feel about how teaching and learning uh, work as interdependent constructs. Uh, Learning is a psychological construct. And so then I ask you all, what are really constructs? You know, examples include love, uh, intelligence, and happiness, right? Because these are things that are really more abstract in nature. They're abstract notions that we know when something exists, but we can't really put our fingers on it, right? We can't measure it directly. It's kind of similar to that deja vu feeling that we get when we get a feeling for something, right? But how do we really then qualify that feeling as if it's a, a useful assessment tool then in the classroom? So that's really kind of what the 77 course is going to look at. And instead, what we then look for are those associated patterns, and we try to measure correlated subjective behaviors from those patterns. But when we do that, that relies then on our really unsubstantiated and intuitive measures. So we must be able to then verify and test those intuitive tools that we employ from time to time. And we all do this. So, so first, let me just briefly explore with you, I guess, some of the theory behind the 7070 quiz, and then we'll get into some of the more applications. Okay, so our metacognitive toolbox, this is comprised of uh, four different, each of these are a presentation in and of themselves, but we're gonna take a, a brief look at how these all come together to form the 7070 quiz. Um, and we're gonna look at classroom outcomes and effectiveness, and we're gonna look at it from both the instructor side and the student side. And we're gonna look at then how these then help to both challenge and then operationalize our instructor's uh, intuition. So instructors need help at operationalizing or basically reifying their intuitive methods and gestures in order to then observe and be able to then make some insights and interpret uh, the interactions that they encounter in order to then share their intuition. The metacognitive tool set here helps to frame the metacognitive process and exploration of intuition through the congruency model. And there are many different types of congruency models that exist, but we're going to focus on this one that we're going to talk about today. Um, so the congruency model helps to frame the, uh, in the part of the exploring our intuition. Then there's also the three responsibilities of the student, and then there's the e FEMA, and finally the 7070 quiz itself. So the first two, the congruency model and the three responsibilities of the student, provide instructors that framework to challenge their results and the effectiveness of those of results in the classroom. And then the latter uh, tools, the e FEMA and the 7070 quiz help to challenge and then operationalize their instructor's intuition. But then combining those two together in conjunction, the four become powerful metacognitive tools that help to enhance both student learning and instructor teaching. So today's session is really going to focus on the merits of the 7070 quiz operating on the teacher's intuition and the potential impact that it has on standalone assessment tool. Um, but then we will also be able to show how powerful it can be when used in conjunction with other metacognitive tools. Sir, is it true that Professor Mary Thought is retiring? Tom, I couldn't tell you if I knew, could I? And by the way, thank you for the pineapple. You're quite right, it is my favorite. But how did you know? Intuition. All right, I like that. I like that slide. I don't know. It's really all about intuition here. Um, 
when we use our intuition, sometimes we're right and sometimes we get it wrong. Uh, the 70-70 quiz is different from other CATs and other classroom assessment techniques in that it's used to measure the instructor's ability to be able to read their students. Um, knowing where your students are through an intuitive lens, that could be a little dangerous though. Um, so I guess I, you know, I could ask you, what are the dangers of that? And really, intuition, it's not always a reliable source of information. It's subjective, it's opinionated, right? We get it wrong sometimes. And then this might introduce different kinds of bias into your instruction. And the biggest problem of all is how do you share your intuition? You can't. So this could then lead to a classroom culture that is really not student-centered and then therefore increases the risk of losing students. Uh, instructors then have to really focus on learning how to operationalize or reaffine their intuition in order to share that thought process. And that's really the key here. So let's take a look at it, like flipping the lens. So we would ask three questions, first of all, because we're gonna look at this from two, two angles here. Um, first of all, what are your students' responsibilities as learners? Second, what are your responsibilities as a teacher? And then ask the question to yourselves, if you've taught, and they don't learn, or if you teach and they don't learn, have you really taught anything? Um, so I like to think of the classroom teaching that this process as a lens, right? Because a, a lens uh, can take in information from either direction. And in this case, we're looking at students on one side of the lens and the instructors will be on the other side. And we want to put them both in focus with each other. And then the idea is that we're going to try to find that balance between teaching and learning. So we're going to look at those first two metacognitive tools and then the second two metacognitive tools from both the instructor side and then the student side. And then how can we merge that together to increase our ability to help our students? So we're talking about, you know, bringing into focus the instructor side and the student responsibilities and the instructor's responsibilities. And so what we're really wanting to look at is, is teaching congruent? Your teaching should be congruent. And that's really what the congruency model is all about. Students though, they also on the flip side have responsibilities. And that's really what the three responsibilities of a student discusses. And then the last components are assessment and evaluation. And those are both necessary conditions of teaching and learning. So we'll take a look um, briefly at each of, the, each of these. Like I said, both of, all of these could be a, um, a presentation of themselves, but briefly looking at the congruency model here, um, it's a curriculum and teaching planning continuum. Uh, so we have instructors that will consider four inter interdependent elements, right? The philosophy, instruction, assessment, and evaluation. Its success is, or failure is really determined by how congruent or in other words, consistent each component is and how, how, how much consistency uh, the continuum therefore creates. Um, and so the sequence kind of goes as follows, right? So let's take a look through it. First, under the philosophy, instructors should examine their philosophical beliefs. We begin to explore how people learn and then second, subsequently how we teach them. Um, so as an instructor in the classroom, everything that you bring into that classroom, all that background knowledge, that theoretical knowledge that we bring into the teaching, that's all really important. And then second, as we move along the line, we, we look at our instruction. Um, we then begin to develop instructional strategies, hopefully that are congruent with our philosophy. And your philosophy is really the essence that underpins or supports how we teach in the classroom. Uh, what we believe, everything we brought in, that's the way we're going to instruct. And so the instruction is not just what you're doing in the classroom, but it, it's how you're doing it. For example, the materials you're using, your activities, you know, the way you approach a lesson, the, and then the feedback that you're given. So everything that you're doing 
in the classroom goes into this and it depends on how you view learning. And really then it's how learning then begins to happen. And so then when we develop our instructional beliefs, we tend to hold on to those and protect those concepts regarding you know, what our style of method is of instruction. And everybody's a little different, um, such as like our group work or do you like discussion or do you like think pair share? And we all have our different uh, you know, methods. Um, so the instructional approaches that we employ often have the greatest impact on those latent skills that we price so highly, right? Like uh, we want students to collaborate. We want them to generate critical thinking skills. We want them to develop empathy and et cetera, et cetera. So all those other latent uh, skills that come out of it. So then moving a little bit more further down, we reach assessment. And then, so the third component consists of, you know, Instructors have to then, after they instruct, find a way to develop or select a certain kind of assessment. And hopefully that assessment is consistent with the nature of which their instruction is. So how do you really measure it, right? The measurement of progress, right? Are students successful? So once we have that instruction component, then good teachers also assess. And the assessment tools should be created as the instructional methods are developed. So this is where congruence, you can see, is very critical. Instructors should be able to carefully select the assessment tools that allow authentic measurement of the student's progress, and then be able to show the effectiveness of those methods. Okay, and then finally, in the evaluation component, uh, after we've done the assessing, right, once we've assessed, this is the piece that really good teachers do. Um, this is that interpretive light um, that kind of gets shined on the whole process. Once the students take an assessment and I begin to look at their performance, I should be thinking about what are the students doing and, what, and why are they doing it? Um, if they're making mistakes, in why? Um, if they're missing things, what's the reasoning for that? Is it because they weren't studying or maybe they just don't care? Are they missing class? Maybe it's my materials or the way I deliver the content or the way I'm presenting something. Maybe we went through it too quickly. You know, there's a lot of reasons out there. Um, maybe it's just the way that the course is set up. Um, so that's all part of the interpret, uh, interpretive part. Um, so going back again, the congruency model as a whole then says, really the essence is good teachers are congruent at each one of these levels, the philosophy, instruction, assessment, and evaluation. And the most critical component here is that congruence relationship. Um, each stage offers multiple points of reflection and feedback. So you've got your philosophy that tells us how we should be teaching and how you are teaching is how you should then be testing. And once you look at a test, maybe then think about what are the students really doing? How can I then go back and either change my instruction to personalize it more to the, the class, or maybe I need to change my assessments? So if we apply this properly, instructors can then be inspired to hopefully reevaluate their underlying philosophical beliefs themselves. Rarely, though, do we actually go back and sort of change our own philosophies of you know, how we view everything, but it can happen. Uh, so then we look at the students' performances, right? Um, was it because they really didn't understand and they didn't learn, or was it because it was just a mismatch? So this is where the 70-70 quiz is going to be situated around. It's going to be right between the assessment and the evaluation component, so that when you're assessing in a particular way and you're sort of gardening some insight, uh, sort of operationalizing your intuitions so that you can then influence those two components. Um, it's applicable to both, and this is really the uh, most powerful part, it's applicable to both instructors and instructional teams as a cohesive group. Okay, so that's kind of some of the theory of the congruence model, how that plays a, a part of the 70-70 quiz. So what we're going to do a little bit here is drilled now down on the student side. So we're talking a little bit more about the instructor's responsibilities there. Let's take a look on the other side now about the students. All right, so 
Now we're going to talk about the student's responsibility. So, you know, students must learn the information, but it's the instructor's responsibilities to help create the environment uh, for learning to occur. So instructors provide, you know, the tools for learning, but how do we know that learning is actually taking place? So this is the, you know, the intuitive sense, you know, we cannot see inside of our students' heads, you know, even though sometimes we wish we could. Um, so we rely on our observations of how students interact and engage with each other, the material and the questions they ask. And after learning the material, then the students must be able to call upon that information and be able to express it or articulate it in the correct form when it's demanded to do so by, by the assessment. Um, so this is the proving component. Um, the critical component here, um, going back to the congruency model, um, is that we expect the students to be able to articulate what they have learned on the assessments. Um, so this is where our expectations of our students on the assessment should be in line with the style of instruction. And if not, then, you know, there's going to be an incongruence. So, for example, um, if I'm teaching a vocabulary lesson, you know, doing road memorization, and then I give an assessment in essay form. Um, so how should I expect my students to perform on that? Um, how might they perform if, you know, I give them a multiple choice exam instead? So, you know, perhaps a different form of assessment would be more appropriate for that style of instruction or expected level of learning. So this is why congruency is critical um, between our instruction and assessment. So um, there's typically, um, typically instructors assess um, student learning outcomes using classroom assessment techniques or CATS. Um, CATS are generally simple um, in-class activities designed to, to give you and your students useful feedback on the teaching learning process. Um, the purpose of CATS is to ensure that formative and ongoing feedback allows instructors to adapt and improve the, the learning process. So the 7070 quiz operationalizes the feedback from student learning and better allows instructors to modify the trajectory of the class to meet um, student learning outcomes. So there are two main forms of assessment. Um, there's formative assessments that serve as warning signals. So the idea is that there's still time to make improvements in student learning outcomes. Um, the ongoing feedback they provide allows time for both the instructor and the students to be uh, proactive and help identify what types of adjustments are needed. Um, so that so that when it comes to you know those summative assessments, they don't bomb the midterm or the final exam. The seventy seventy quiz is designed to observe students' behaviors and interactions with each other. As instructors, we can only assess what's going on within the confines of our own classrooms. In class, of course, we ask our students to produce in a number of ways through asking questions, submitting assignments, and even something as simple as seeing a classmate exchange a bewildered glance with a friend when they don't understand the materials. We then have to determine how to assess these exchanges as well as assign meaning to each one. And finally, we have to take all of these observations into account to question how this information changes our perspective about the class, along with our goals and our methods for reaching that class. Okay, so we're going to turn things over to you for a second. And what I'd like you to do in the chat box is to drop a response. Give me one adjective you would use to describe your best instructor and one you would use to describe your worst instructor. So we'll give it a minute. So go ahead, drop an adjective in the chat box, either your best instructor or your worst. Okay, so best was aware, worst was boring. I see flexible, I see enthusiastic and boring. Boring's a popular one so far. Very good, thank you. So something to note, most likely what's happening with both your best instructors and your worst instructors is that they both prize themselves on their intuitive abilities. 
Oh, student-centered versus boring. So there's that boring again. Yeah. That's student -centered. Chris, can you switch to the next slide, please? Thank you. So something that happened due to COVID and the ongoing pandemic is that many of us, probably all of us, were pivoted very quickly to online and hybrid environments. And of course, this has increased our challenge of connecting with our students in the classroom tremendously. So those retention strategies that we tend to use, those student services and other parts of the campus that are so crucial for our students are not always available. And instead, the front line of the classroom is really where we need to retain students. If we're not closely connected to where our students are, then we're going to lose them, especially in an online environment, so, which is even more difficult. So learning our students and knowing them remotely is incredibly challenging. Here, we have to ask ourselves, how do I know where they are in their learning processes? Because we can't assess them the way we normally would in the classroom and we can't interact with them the way we would normally interact. So instead, we have to turn to our instructors, the help of our instructors on the front line who are employing some of these retention strategies within the classroom. I'm going to turn things to Patrick real quick, who can discuss his nursing SI experience over the past year and a half. Oh, sure. Um, so I also teach supplemental instruction for our first semester nursing students. And Really what that's about, is the, the very first semester, we look at the very fundamentals of nursing, and we it's an eight-week class, and we want to get to the very core concepts as quickly as possible, and it moves very fast. And the nursing students, they don't have a lot of time, so their biggest uh, roadblocks are uh, time management and organization. And one thing I would do with the supplemental instruction in person is really try to synchronize um, everybody's expectations and get on board with everybody at this you know men mental level, like this intuitive level, and try to um, get into the minds of the students and model for them what's the best practices and techniques for learning uh, this specific material. So it's really contextualized. And one of the greatest problems I've been having since COVID started, and we've all been remote, is I lost that, that classroom interaction. I'm lucky if I get like a list of names now, I really don't get to know our students. And that, that's the key, like know our students. It, it's more than just by their name, it's by you know, the way they communicate, the body language, just you know, getting to, to know them in person, it, it's a much different experience. And, and now that they're, I don't know, and some of you may have had the same experiences, it's hard just to get them to turn their cameras on, just to even see you know, a picture. Um, and I understand that you know there's lots of multiple reasons for that, but um, it makes it very difficult to actually get to get any sense uh, intuitively how I can then begin to connect with these students. And um, it, it was a, a very very big challenge. We make a lot of accommodations and a lot of adjustments really rapidly in order to try to. Um, get the students working together and efficiently and get them on board. To, so there was a, a lot of flipping and doing really fast. Uh, we did get really creative, but it was definitely a challenge trying to move out into this online environment. Um, really, it's about establishing that connection and that intuitive um, ability to figure out how's the best way I can connect with these students so I can reach them and help them. And so that was a, a big struggle. Thank you for sharing, Patrick. So our department has created a number of tools focusing around intuition. These tools help to create a mutually beneficial connection between our teachers and our students. Employed in conjunction with the 7070 quiz, the purpose of these tools is to help reify your intuition and potentially create a more flexible curriculum that provides a better path to success for your students. Okay, so... Um... We've given you some of the theoretical background, just a little taste of it. Uh, we haven't really talked about the actual 7070 quiz and what it is in the classroom. So we're gonna take a look at it now. So we mentioned how the 7070 quiz is a classroom assessment technique, but it is designed to focus on the preparedness of the students. Um, but okay, so it, 
let me start that again. Sorry. The class, the 770 quiz is designed not to focus on the preparedness of the students, but rather the intuitive capabilities of the instructor. And that is the key difference. Um, the instructor's goal is to be able to write that quiz such that they are confident, we said that 70% of their students can achieve a score of 70% or higher. And that is going to help us provide some more elaborate feedback um, than other types of cats will be able to present to us. So we said instructors will examine their underlying philosophies, their instruction, and then the way they assess teaching and learning, and then their ability to evaluate that entire process. It is also designed to then challenge the intuitive assumptions of our instructors and utilize that in the assessment process because the instructors rarely probably challenge are challenged on their own efficacy in interpreting the insights provided from formative assessments. Um, so here, the, really, this, the attempt is to reframe our assumptions about our students and then to determine where they are currently instead of where we believe they should be. Uh, this entire process where we realize it's a little bit more visceral in nature than cognitive. Chris? Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I like to think of four different ways that we could kind of describe what the 77 quiz really is. So these four little uh, sayings here. Uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? Um, remember, Cats, classroom assessment techniques, are usually used to assess our students. But the key difference here is now we are using it to assess our instructors. Uh, focus is really on the intuitive capabilities of the instructor, not the student's preparedness for taking that quiz or exam. So the 70-70 quiz is really centered on where the students currently are, not where they should be. That's the, the key difference. And it also differs from other cats because it measures the instructor's ability to be able to read their students. Uh, it also helps instructors understand the way they process formative and ongoing feedback early in the term. So the next quote, feedback is the breakfast of champions. So that's a quote that's often attributed to Ken Blanchard. And as we all know, breakfast really is the most important meal of the day. And because without a good breakfast, you won't have the energy to get through the day. Likewise, Without all that feedback coming from the, uh, the students, the classroom instruction is going to starve. It operates in a sort of like a vacuum, and you cannot improve, you can't adapt, you can't evolve, you can't do anything. So you really need that feedback. And then also, if the Sherlock Holmes, well, as instructors, what we are really asking ourselves here is how well do you think you know your students? So we have to kind of play detective here. So much like a detective, we're trying to solve the great mystery of why some students do not perform as we would expect. And then we have to begin to connect the clues in order to determine if learning is really taking place. Are the students really learning, but just not able to express what they have learned in the correct form and maybe at the correct time? Um, and then the next one, the sinking ship. Uh, if you think of your class as a, as a giant ship, right? And you're, you're the captain, you're steering the ship, you want to get it to sh shore safely. Some of your students are going to have gaps in their schema, and you can't stop and focus just on a few students that are struggling, right? Uh, these are like the holes in your ship. And since you have to take that entire class to the destination, you have to think about how are you going to move that class forward with all these holes? Because the ship is taken on water and we don't want it to sink. And then lastly, uh, oh, no, Seth Morris. So then, okay, so then what we do then to help prevent that is we're going to give the 77 equals early in the term and then after a short review period because we want to know how we can meet our students where they are now versus where we think they should be. So much like a race, we want all of our students together at the start line. So the question then becomes, how do you get them where they need to be so that the students with the knowledge gaps have an equitable start? And for those individual students, perhaps we can address that with supplemental instruction, tutoring, maybe other types of prescription, prescriptive interventions can assist, while then the instructor focuses on the, the group as a whole. 
Okay, so Carmela is going to take you through the process of actually doing a 77 crystal. Sorry about that. The process begins at the start of the term. Instructors give a short one to two week review. The review purpose is to refresh prior content and fill in any small gaps in schema directly related to the upcoming material. Early feedback is critical to future success. At the end of the review, construct a quiz that you are confident 70% of your students will pass at a 70% proficiency level. Do not focus on where the students should be at that time, but where the instructors think the students are based on observations during the interactions throughout the review. There are two basic levels of analysis, the individual student and the class as a group. The emphasis is on the overall curriculum congruence and the instructor's intuition. Here, we focus on the group performance. Individual student performance will diverge. Some interventions can center on supplemental instruction, such as tutoring or a combination of other supportive measures. After creating a 7070 quiz, analyze what percent of students achieve the 70% proficiency level. If fewer than 70%, how many did achieve proficiency? By giving a 7070 quiz early in the term, you have the luxury of time to adapt your instruction. Instructors forecast initial quiz results and then reflect upon where the students actually are compared to where you believe they should be. After some introspective analysis regarding your methods of instruction and assessment, try to determine if an incongruency exists, or if not, what other factors may be contributing to your students' under, underperforming results? Throughout the reflection period, instructors begin to challenge their intuitive capabilities. Instructors should concentrate on their ability to assess their students in order to adjust the journey, not the destination. So then the question becomes, how to adjust going forward. Hopefully now you know where the students are rather than where they are not. How does this change your path going forward? What will you do differently? Will this information change the way you construct future lessons, quizzes, tests, resources, etc.? Take the time to write out your results and subsequent plans. When the term is complete, revisit these observations and reflect on the journey. Did this exercise change your experience and that of your students in the class? Reflecting on our abilities as instructors includes examining all aspects of our teaching. First of all, our personal experiences as students. We all remember our best and also worst instructors. Consider creating a critical friends group and connect with colleagues to learn from their perspectives and experiences. Explore theory. It's vital for being open to new ideas or concepts. And most importantly, student feedback, whether verbal or written is invaluable. In utilizing the 7070 quiz, we stop making assumptions on how students learn best as we are going straight to the source. So I was one of the instructors who was lucky enough to be able to have the opportunity to actually do the 7070 quiz within the classroom. And when I set out to create my 7070 quiz, I was 100% confident that my students would easily pass. Many of these students were returning students from previous semester, so students I knew well, and I was sure that everyone would pass my assessment. 
So after our two week review period, I created a 10 question quiz that was a mix of multiple choice, true, false, and short answer. And I gave the students multiple opportunities to answer these questions. I gave the assessment at the beginning of class and all of our students finished within 20 minutes. When I asked the class how they felt about the assessment, their responses were overwhelmingly positive. So every student in there thought that they had aced the assessment. But guess what? My total was 58% of my class who had actually aced the assessment. So it was a little different than anticipating. We were able to give this experience to our instructors as well. So in spring of 2021, we had our ESL and our HSE instructors create and conduct the 7070 quiz in their own classrooms after the first two weeks of class. The instructors then res responded to a survey detailing their experiences and will share some of their thoughts as follows. So a couple of the questions we asked was, how did you approach the assessment? Tell us about your thinking when developing it. One of the responses was, I gave this quiz to my online level three ESL class. When I made the quiz, I wanted to see what the students already knew and what they didn't know. I have several repeaters in the class, but more new students this semester. Other questions were, what were the results? Were they higher or lower than you expected? One of the responses was, overall, they were lower than I expected. Most students had trouble with the grammar, multiple choice questions. Other common problems were answering questions with the correct information and writing answers in the correct verb tense. We also asked, what did you learn from this experience? The response was, I learned that a lot of the students who actively participate in class each week had higher scores on the quiz. I also learned that the students who are repeating the level retained a lot more information over break than I anticipated. The next question is, what is your path forward? The response was, I plan to continue to give a diagnostic quiz in the beginning of each semester. I will have to come up with a plan for students who are repeating so that they are engaged in the class as well. The next question was, does this change the way you will begin the, co begin the course the next time you teach it? It is useful to have this kind of quiz and I would continue to use it, but I need to think more about the questions to use to get closer to the goal. I found out a lot more about what the students know more than what they do know. Okay, so finally, uh, we can see that there's an elephant in the room. Um, so <laughs> traditionally, we, we use cats that are empirical in nature, you know, to measure student learning outcomes. Um, however, intuition, you know, when utilized appropriately can be just as effective a tool. Um, because instructors rely upon intuition to process nonverbal feedback. So, for example, you know, have you ever stood in front of a classroom after giving a lecture and your students' faces are, you know, acting like a mirror, you know, reflecting their thoughts or lack of thoughts, and you instantly know that you may need to revisit that concept again? So intuition then in turn can help you refine your own instruction and assessment modalities, you know, in order to best assure learning occurs. So to sum this all up, um, we can say that intuition remains the discredited elephant in the room. And like we said before, you know, relying on a purely intuitive lens can be dangerous because, you know, we run the risk of making incorrect judgments. So in order to use our intuition effectively, uh, we must challenge and analyze it. So once instructors examine in, um, their intuitive leaps, they will be able to refine and calibrate their ongoing assessments. And hopefully this will encourage their students to mirror those processes so they can evaluate their own learning uh, journey. So the 7070 quiz um, is a tool that helps instructors balance their perception of what is going on in the classroom versus what is actually happening. And now we will take any questions you may have. If 
feel free to add them in the chat box. Any comments? Anything at all? There are there are a couple of questions. The first one is: Is there a peer review component to the seventy seventy quiz for the teachers? I can answer that one since I did the process. So currently, no, there is no peer review component to the 7070 quiz for the teachers. But I do think that's a really good idea moving forward just to get a sense to see how other instructors are approaching the 7070 quiz. Uh, the first time we did this was a pilot. We had a relatively small group of instructors who were able to participate. So we weren't able to expand the testing and the process as much as we would like. So I do think that that's a great idea and definitely something we should consider moving forward. Um, the second question is, how often do you give a 7070 quiz? Patrick, I think that's yours. Well, you definitely want to give it at the beginning of at the, you know, within the first two or three weeks after a short review period. Um, but then you can always give it again to help reevaluate where you know your students are at different points in the lesson or in your class and then what becomes more interesting then is that down the road if you have your curriculum the same way every semester and then you give this the same uh 70 70 quiz you see what the kind of feedback is and then how you maybe and can adapt and evolve your class or how your students then um, maybe change over time and respond differently. Um, so I think the, you know, you definitely want to give it at least once in the beginning, um, but then be consistent um, as you go forward. And then it's kind of an evolving process. After the, you know, the first time you do it, it may not be, you know, maybe, you know, it's really about testing your intuition and ability then to again assess. And are you assessing correctly and making the connections with the, the instruction and maybe your ability to write the 7070 quiz is not as easy as you thought it would be. Um, Lauren, did you ha have any like ideas of having to revise the 7070 quiz after you did it in any ways or, or no? Yeah, it's a really good question, Patrick. So I, I think from my experience, I went into it just being really cocky about it. I thought, okay, I know how to write an assessment. I got this. I know these students. I know how to best reach them. And it didn't go well. You know, when I got my results back, I was really surprised. I remember sitting in my office and I'm grading and I'm grading. I'm like, ooh, this didn't go well. Um, so it, it helped me reflect back on my own processes. And I had to go back and do a deep dive into the questions I asked and looked at, you know, maybe how I asked a question or maybe if there was a way to ask a question differently or maybe just scrap a question and put a new one in its place. In hindsight, what I wish I had done would be to pass the assessment back to the students and kind of get some feedback from them about how they answered questions the way that they did. So again, something to think about in the future. Um, one more question. How do you observe a student who keep their camera off on Zoom? This makes it difficult to evaluate learning. What would you suggest to um, to have them keep their cameras on. That's a very good question. I'm still working on that. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, I, I think part of that is really trying to build that into it, you know, connecting with the students as, as well as you can up front. 
and building that classroom culture where students feel safe and secure and they kind of want to participate and um, uh, talk and be on camera with everyone and get to know their fellow peers. Uh, but there are, you know, we've been making accommodations since we've been online. Um, obviously, some students don't necessarily feel comfortable. Or maybe they're forced to, you know, find a, maybe a busy house or, you know, they're in like a little nook under a stairway or in, their, in the car doing their class now. I've actually had students that, you know, going out to their car because they know if it's quiet. Um, and they, you know, have for a variety of reasons to want to turn their camera on and usually like, we give them a pass on that but in terms of um evaluating learning i i think um it does make it a little bit difficult um i, I do then rely more on if they're not going to turn their camera on for some reason i want them speaking up and participating more and being able to have dialogue and discussion and the way they're they're communicating in other forms um, and, and sometimes the ones that don't put the camera are, are actually the most energetic and, and do talk the most. Um, I don't know if anybody else has some uh, better ideas in terms of evaluating learning. Um, I, I try not to write exams that depend upon, um, you know, if they if they use extra resource or something. It, it's really about you know, are they really making a, a connection with the material? Uh, you know, I don't care if they have a book in front of their look at the answer. They won't be able to look up an answer necessarily. Uh, Lauren, did you have any, anything else for Carmela or Chris? I can jump in, Patrick. Um, so I've, I've taught online for a number of years, um, and it, it is hard to have that connection with your students. But I think that, you know, ideally, much like what Patrick was saying, a lot of our students are coming from situations that they can't control right now. And just trying to reach out to them and connect with them in any way possible. I feel like with the students I teach online, now I have a lot more um, emails, chats coming in a lot more frequently, requests to jump on Zoom. Um, the students do seem to still want that connection. It just might be might not be from them turning their camera on when they're in Zoom. So trying to find other ways to connect. They're out there. Great. Um, we also did have one comment uh, that sounds very helpful to ask students how they interpreted the assessment. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Um, if you think of a question later, we're going to uh, give you our emails in a minute. Uh, we want to thank you for attending our presentation. We hope that you enjoyed learning about the 7070 quiz. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us through email. Um, we would also like to thank Ebony, who invited us to present and who expertly guided us through this entire process. So thank you, Ebony. We appreciate you reaching out to us and um, asking us to present. It was exciting to collaborate with the East Coast uh, other, I'm sorry, the East Coast educators. Thank you. Do you want to put the email slide up, please? And you, you don't have to email all of us. You can just email one of us and we'll all, um, we'll all share the information. Thank you, Connie. You stay safe also. Thank you all. I learned a lot today. I didn't know too much about the 77 quiz before this, so I'm happy to absorb all this information. Um, yeah, again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, again, I'll be sending a follow-up email with slides from today's presentation and contact information for all presenters in case you did have another question. And yeah, again, thank you all for coming. Oh, and I'll also plug the Next webinar we have lined up, I'll drop the link for that in the email as well. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ebony. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Recording stopped. Thanks, everyone. Ander says thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to re upload the PowerPoint to Teams and Carmel, if you want to 
I don't know if you want to upload it to the Google so that they have that most updated version. Okay. Sure. You can just send me a copy, whatever's easiest. Great. So I'll uh, have this out um, ASAP, probably tomorrow morning. Okay. How many people attended? Do you know? Uh, I think it was 15. Okay, That's good. Which I anticipated because yeah. usually when we get a certain number, it's usually half that exactly. because people are expecting the recording because mm -hmm. they know they can't come. So, and things you know, this happens, you know, right? Like yeah. today, um, we had so many meetings, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I think people, um, what we do at NELRC, it's they like the small audiences, that's kind of why we kind of keep it at network so people yeah. can have chance to kind of interact with the host so yeah we expect smaller turnouts but um 